conference, and I just want to show appreciation for everyone who showed up and gave their support. Um, just as an introduction, uh, the Future Technologies for Water Competition, otherwise known as FTW for short, is uh, the Water Institute's first ever technology competition. So this has been very successful, very successful for its first year. <laughs> And it was sponsored by the Takata Foundation. Um, and it's really, the mission of this competition is to really find innovative ideas and um, just support those ideas and pushing them to the next level. So of those, we have received 73 applications. Um, from then, we have 15 semifinalists. And the semifinalist phase was very comprehensive. All the teams worked really hard in developing very thorough business plans, creating video demonstrations. Um, so it was very competitive. And so we've narrowed it down to three finalists. And I will introduce them in the order that they're presenting. So from the team Planktos Instruments, representing them will be Dr. Scott and Sign. Um, Plankto's Instruments is developing the next generation of water quality monitoring equipment using autonomous, trackable, and retrievable sensor platforms that provide remote access to real-time environmental data. Team Espresso, oh, sorry, the second presenter will be Team Air 2.0 um, by Guy Katz. He's, our, he's the representative of that team. Um, air 2.0 is a low-cost, portable technology that harvests drinking water from atmospheric air. And the third team, Team Espresso, will be talking about smart, smart monitoring of heavy metals in mine effluents. So with um, a warm round of applause, just thank the three finalists for making it to this stage. And with that, I will open the floor to uh, Scott from Team Planktos to lead the first, uh, the first presentation. While he does a setup, if you haven't already received a little slip um, with the three team names, we're just trying to get some public participation in voting for the, like, the people's choice of their favorite of the three teams. And during the conference dinner on Wednesday, we will announce the final results from the competition. Uh, the first prize is $15,000. The second prize is $5,000. And we hope that um, the people's choice will always also add another award and an acknowledgement. And if you need a little slip, Ashley McKinney right there has a handful. And if you raise your hand, I can also pass it back to those in the back row. Okay. Thank you. Did you? Um, Give me a little help here. Ah. So that's the one we want to open. So it's not showing up on here. Here he comes to the rescue. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's that one. Yep. <laughs> and the answer was as easy as using a mouse. OK, well, while we're getting that set up, thank you so much for coming today. I want to thank the Takata, Takata for hosting the competition. This is an awesome opportunity for us. I want to thank the UNC Water Institute for hosting the event and thank Crystal and Jacqueline for their help behind the lines, getting all the logistics figured out. This has gone very smoothly and we're, we're really excited to be here. So <clears throat> I'm going to start this competition by thinking big. Okay, we're going to look big. This is the Mississippi River in Minnesota and just kind of setting the stage for the scale of the problem scientifically 
and the scale of the environment that our technology is really going to focus on is really spanning this entire range of systems from big rivers like the Mississippi to small streams and creeks. Okay. So what's the problem? The problem is that we need more efficient means to identify where pollutants come from and how they travel through the environment. Okay, so there's, there's two components to that in terms of locating where pollutants enter streams. Point sources are not a problem, that's pretty easy. But non-point sources have plagued us for years in the sciences, trying to figure out and attribute pollution in waterways to non-point source, uh, sources. The second aspect of this is how they travel through the environment. There's two sides of that story. There's how quickly pollutants move downstream, okay? And there's also how those pollutants change as they move downstream. So, what's our solution? Our solution is to tag water and to embed sensors within the water itself and let the water carry the instrumentation downstream. So let me talk a minute about tagging things. So we tag all kinds of things. We tag right whales. If you want to know how to protect a right whale from ship strikes, you under, have to understand its behavior. So we tag the animals, we understand their behavior, and it helps us modify what we do to reduce ship strikes for right whales. We tag humans. Okay? If you work in a radioactive environment, you receive a radiation badge that integrates your exposure to radiation over time. Okay, in both those cases, the key is by understanding the individual, we have much more accurate information about how to gauge their risk and address that. Okay, the same, th same thing is true in rivers. What we want to do is tag a parcel of water, in theory, by embedding this instrument in the flow of water and let it do the work of traveling downstream collecting data, and telling us where it finds problems in the river, where pollutants are entering the river, and not only that, tell us how quickly they're moving downstream and how they're changing during transit. Okay, So that's our solution, is tagging water. All right, I'm going to do my best Steve Jobs imitation and show you our product. This is the hydrosphere. And as you can see, it's a sphere, okay? We designed it as a sphere so it'll travel more easily with less risk of hitting trees and getting stuck in grocery carts along the bottom of a river. On this end, there are sensors, okay? This one measures dissolved oxygen, salinity, light, uh, and temperature, okay? This is kind of our, what we envision to be our base model. And it can do two things. It can travel down a river submerged, okay? So it's profiling throughout the water column, and it's also reducing its uh, potential damage from things at the surface. We can also, by simply removing that instrument capsule inside, which contains all the electronic guts, we can turn that upside down, have the sensors facing down, and it'll float at the surface. And what we can do is put an instrument capsule in the top here as an additional module with a GPS and a cell phone in it, cell phone device, and it'll measure its location, collect information from the sensors, and send that information to your cell phone or your email or however you want to use the data. So it gives us real-time data as it travels downstream in a variety of fashions. And we're designing this to be modular. So we have some sensors on here. We need to expand that to include other uh, parameters, such as using fluorometers, we can measure chlorophyll, we can measure oil and gas, we can measure sewage effluent that's entering the river. So we can take this to a variety of different levels and add more capabilities to it. I don't know if Steve Jobs probably had more fun with that, with rousing applause, but it's the best I can do. So let me just give you a, a quick show of the data that we collected with that instrument that I just showed you. A couple of weeks ago, we took it out to the Noose River at Kinston and put it in the water, and it disappeared into the murk. And it popped up 24 hours later on command, halfway to New Bern. So it traveled about 44 kilometers downstream. And, and this is some of the data on the top is the depth. So you can see from the uh, several positions along the way, uh, we were measuring depth as we followed it. 
I failed to mention that there's a radio transmitter on the hydrosphere, so it's always telling you where it is. You use a radio direction finder to find it, or you can put base stations along the river as gates to monitor where it's going. Okay, we were measuring light. It shows you when the sun comes up. Sun shows you when the sun goes down in the river, but it also gives you some information about optical properties of the water, which if you're interested in primary production, algal blooms, that is an important piece of the story. The dissolved oxygen reflects uh, actually, one thing that we're looking at in the study that, that we were helping with, with our first customer at Duke University, Martin Doyle, we're looking at productivity in the river, phytoplankton growth. And so dissolved oxygen is our metric of that growth in this study. And specific conductivity. One of the interesting things and one of the primary values of this approach is the fact that it gives you a seamless representation of the environment. And what that allows you to do is pick out how point sources, not just pipes, but also river confluences, affect the environment. So, for example, conductivity uh, went down here, we suspect, because it was passing the confluence of Contentnia Creek, which is a, a coastal plain tributary of the, of the Neuse River. So, there's an example of the data that we're collecting in a very simple fashion. So, let's move on and talk about kind of our business model. We've got three value propositions. And the first is that the device replaces a lot of labor for academics who are in the field trying to understand water pollution, water movement, pollutant transport. What are they doing now? Well, here's some approaches, and these are actually uh, very recent cutting edge approaches. One is to put instruments on a boogie board, float those down the river, and carry it over the shallow spots. Another, if you're working in big rivers, is to go out in a raft and float down the river in the raft with your flashlight on at night and take measurements from the raft. Okay. These, th I'm not downplaying the importance of this research. It's, it's great data and it's great research. But we've got new technologies that we can use and I hope what we're developing is perhaps a replacement for putting people in the field for long periods of time. Okay, so that's one value proposition. Another is that if you're a manager looking at pollutant transport, you want to know at all times where pollutants are as, as they go downstream. So with a suite of hydrospheres in the river, you're monitoring the advancement of that material downstream. You're getting that information coming to your cell phone. So it gives you real-time actionable information on where pollutants are moving. Finally, industry and their consultants are charged with developing water quality models and parameterizing water quality models to examine how their discharge affects the environment and where it goes and how fast and what happens during transport. Okay? That requires some field work if you want good data. And one of the approaches that we use currently is to use tracers like rhodamine dye and you see in the lower left. So again, these are field studies that require labor. They require a lot of time and instrumentation in the field. What we're proposing is that instrumentation that's autonomous and trackable and retrievable may be a substitute for some of what we do to collect this data. In the end, it provides industrial dischargers with better data that can stop, hopefully, some of the finger pointing that evolves in river systems trying to attribute a, a, degradation of the environment to particular individual dischargers. So the key there is better data, more accurate data, and lower cost. Okay, so what are we doing? What I just showed you are really a series of hypotheses. Okay, what we're doing is trying to test those hypotheses before we invest an enormous amount of resources into developing our product to make sure that we identify the problem that we think consumers have and that our solution is actually something they'll buy. So with help from our mentoring team from the Center for Entrepreneurial Development in Durham, North Carolina, uh, we have developed a series of questions uh, that we're doing phone uh, call interviews to gather this information and, and summarize it in a quantitative way. The second thing we're doing is we're taking the hydrosphere to people and we're showing it to them. We're showing them the data, showing them how it works, gauging their reaction. Is this something that solves their problem? Is this something they would buy? So our markets, we're starting in academia. That's where I'm from. That's where I have a few contacts and that's where I feel most comfortable. 
about trying to sell this to people. So we're starting with academia. We've made some conservative estimates of what the size of these markets are, at least in the short term that we could hit in terms of advertising. And uh, what we're doing is moving from left to right through these markets. So we're starting in academia and, and moving into government and industry and consulting. So where are we now? Well, we've just had a pretty blockbuster year. It's been great. We've gone from a, a pretty ugly looking PVC contraption that I built in the garage with some very crude electronics, uh, something that my partner now kind of looks at and laughs. We've gone from that to what might be a little bit prettier, but is in every way more sophisticated electronically uh, now. We've done all that in about nine months, and we've attracted our first customer. We've sold two. We've got an order for two more. And what we need to do in the next six months is secure our IP. We need to develop better probes and, and expand the range of sensing options that we have on the device. So as I mentioned, fluorometers are, are one key piece of technology. I think that'll expand our capabilities. And hopefully, in our customer discovery process, we're going to find out what customers want on there and what, what parameters they want to measure. OK, so I'll leave you with a picture of our first early evangelist customer who knew that he had a problem. He couldn't figure out a way to solve the problem himself or buy a solution from another manufacturer. So he took a risk on a, on a new startup to provide a solution. We provided the solution, the hydrosphere, and here he is happy in the river that we retrieved the, his, his uh, device and he's got the data he needs. And I hope that this time next year I can show you a whole slide presentation of happy customers that are, that are enjoying our product. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward to your questions, I think, maybe after everyone's presented. Um, just as you said, I forgot to mention that each presenter has prepared 15 minutes, and at the very end, um, just to respect the time limit of ending at 6, then if you would like, you can speak with the finalists for your questions. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Guy, and I'm here to talk to you about Air2O. Um, at any given moment, there are 13,000 cubic kilometers of water dissolved in the atmosphere. This is more fresh water than all the water in all the rivers of the world combined. We at Air2O, our goal is to tap into this resource and provide fresh water for people in water-scarce areas. Our team is comprised of two uh, founding members, me and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is currently a resident at Metro Health and I'm finishing my last year of medical school right now. We also enlisted a CPA and are working with a Beersheva BGU, it's Ben Gurion University, where I'm from, um, of the Engineers Without Borders to help us along with our um, technological side. Our story starts here in Beersheva. And Beersheva is the largest city in the Negev Desert in the south of Israel. That's where I'm from. And if you take uh, your car and drive about five minutes out of Beersheva, you get here. These are Bedouin villages, and, um, which are natives to Israel. They were there before the country started. And they are, many of them reside in unrecognized settlements. These settlements are off-grid. They don't have electricity and or power. And we meet a lot of them, a lot of the children anyway, at the, the hospital as a medical student, uh, usually from diarrheal illness of all sorts, be it uh, bacterial or parasitical. This got us thinking, how can we address this subject? How can we get to people who are completely off-grid and still help them provide, provide water for them? When we thought about this, we realized, of course, this is not an issue solely with the Bedouin people in the south of Israel. According to latest CUN numbers, there are about 783 million people worldwide which are live in a water-scarce environment. This is more than the population of the U.S. doubled. A lot of these people have to travel on average two hours a day in order to provide the fresh water they require to live. And the last number is that about seven to eight million people die each year of water and or water related diseases. This is the population of Israel, my home country, every year. So we thought, 
how do people get water nowadays? What do they do? There are usually actually three main routes of getting water. The first one is getting water that's there. What does that mean? Either large bodies of water or groundwater mining. So that's one option. Other option is atmospheric water generator. Getting, um, absorbing moisture out of air and condensing it into water. And the first op third option is desalination. All of these options have shortcomings when it comes to our specific problem, what we thought of. When you talk about groundwater mining, you're talking about a finite resource. If you drill all or mine all the water that's there, you're done. Also, it's immobile. You can't shift the well from place to place where the water are, they're gonna stay that way. When you talk about atmospheric water generation, generators, you got something that's usually very uh, energy inefficient, or not inefficient, but it takes a lot of energy. You need to be on the grid, and also it's expensive. And when you talk about desalination, you have to have, of course, access to salt water, and you have to have, sorry, and, you, and it, also it is a costly operation. The devices themselves cost money. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make something that's portable, that's gonna be low cost, and that's gonna be modular so we can hook it up together even if it's not as efficient as uh, a desalinator like where I live, uh, there's the biggest desalination plant in the world. But if it's modular, we can hook them up and try and make something that's worthwhile, that can make enough water for people to live off. So what I'm gonna show you now is an illustration. Um, it's just um, a small animation to explain in broad terms the, the idea of the tech. Um, this is a, a gross simplification of it. There's a lot of math going into it, but just to get uh, the idea of it. So as you can see, we're using sunlight as a heating source and we're cooling not just when the ambient atmosphere and while we're condensed. Um, it's important to say that we do have an IP on this, so we filed for non-provisional. I know you don't care so much, but still, okay. So um, after I showed you like a small animation, I wanted to show you something of it working. Our real prototype or a prototype that's working is very bulky and you can't really see into it. So I, I improvised something that you can see the process working. So I took a small video. Um, I made that, that area clear so you can see what's going in. This is the, these are the conditions. I'm pouring in hot oil right now. The oil is about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. It simulates the sun, the heating source. Glass is where it's gonna, water is gonna condense on, condense on. And this is the condensation, cha condensation chamber. As you can see, Water is formed, there's even a bit of beading there, which is a lot of water. That's all the water in that pocket, all the wa water in that moisture that was trapped in that air pocket has condensed on the table. The upside of this is that we didn't use any cooling devices, which means we can do this basically electricity free. We can do this solely from sunlight because you only heated it up. So the applications for this are of course numerous. It can be for drinking water, it can be for agriculture. Again, the modular, modular idea I talked to you about earlier. If you hook them up together, you can produce enough water to supply some fields. Money is microfinancing, selling this um, water out. Camping in a more developed world um, um, situation. If you wanna go camping and don't wanna lug around your, all your water. Army bases. I myself have uh, been a, a sergeant in the Israeli paratroopers for three years. And I know it's damn hard to get water everywhere you need it, out in the field. So army installations will require, will always require water, so this is something for them as well. And disaster relief. Disaster relief, of course, a situation when something was on grid and now it's become off grid because the grid or infrastructure has been destroyed, you can use this product. The business model, or what are we gonna do in the next, the coming year or so? So we're gonna start out um, by working on our prototype, developing it, improving it, maximizing the efficiency. After that, I'm gonna do a pilot phase, which is um, I'm gonna address students uh, in the Bedouin population around my house, uh, get about five of them, get them some of the better prototypes, get them t testing it. Afterwards, you wanna test it in other places, because just because it works in the Negev Desert in Israel, doesn't mean it's gonna work the same on a mountainside or on a beachfront. We wanna see how it works or how it changes there after we make the appropriate modifications according to these testes, testes, tests, I'm sorry, it's my second language. Um, uh, we're gonna do a primary rollout, which means we're gonna 
try and start selling them first online and also trying to grab some wholesale accounts, working through NGOs, having them be our, our, our feet on the ground. And then we're gonna concentrate, shift mostly towards wholesale accounts. And when I say that, I mean establishing partnerships with organizations that know the territory. Uh, we envision ourselves as a tech developing uh, company and not as a um, distribution company. There are people there, they're doing good work, they know the, the, the geography, they know the terrain, they know the people, and they can do a much better job than we can. So if we work through them by giving them some models for testing, some giving them some free uh, samples, as we say, and making them want to buy some more from us. And of course, it's not, it doesn't mean we're going to be shy about selling to individual users. This is, uh, at the end, something that's going to provide water to a lot of people, we hope. So I'd like to leave you with this and say it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's love it here. It's a very nice place. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Arun Bhatt. I'm a master's student at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, my teammate, Christina Marlene, she's also a graduate student at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and uh, Pallavi Roy just graduated from Ryerson in Toronto. Uh, together, we have team Espresso. We kind of came up with the name during a conference in the Netherlands when we heard that we made it as one of the finalists and we had to think about a team name, uh, by which time we'd spent three, three weeks in, in the Netherlands. We were craving for our American coffee. We couldn't get it anywhere. Everywhere we would go, we'd get like, this tiny cup of uh, espresso. But over time, we did develop a taste for it, which was like, it's quick, it's efficient, and it's, it gets the job done, which is sort of what we are aiming at. So it's, what we do is smart monitoring of heavy metal in the mine affluent. Uh, so a bit about mining. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, a bit about mining. Uh, mining contributes to about 11.5% to the global GDP. When its in indirect impact is coupled with agriculture, transport, and construction, so what I mean is fertilizers for agriculture, fuel, and raw material for construction, it contributes a significant amount, almost 45%. However, it is still viewed as an uh, extraction-based industry and not as a developmental industry. And that's primarily because of its severe uh, social and environmental impact. Uh, but, well, what do you know? With the rate of urbanization, almost 60 to 80 million people globally move to cities, we will continue to depend on mines. We need mines for laptops, phones, they're like building blocks for a modern society. Even if we think from a sustainability perspective, we come up with hybrid cars, it requires twice as much more copper than a regular car. If we make, turn every building into a LEED certified building, we still need raw material to make it. So we need mines. Which brings us to my catchphrase, creating minds of the future. Uh, a bit about our journey, how we started and where we are now. Uh, I call this the innovation road trip. At some point, we we, we were thinking where we are and where we want to be, and we think that innovation is something that doesn't end at the product level or the service level and, or the business model level itself. It needs to ensure that it takes care of the product and the after effects that arise from the consumption of the product. So we basically, uh, when we go forward with the presentation, you'll get it. Uh, we started as a group uh, during Wet Skills Water Challenge in June 2014. It was organized as a part of, uh, uh, as a Dutch water partnership. And uh, it brought together students from the Netherlands and Canada to work on water-related problems. They also brought uh, 
uh, small scale industries to come and give us real opportunities to work on. So we uh, had two mentoring companies, uh, a Dutch company called Inca Solution, they work on monitoring, and a Canadian company called Can North. They're completely owned by the First Nation and they work in northern Saskatchewan uh, with several mining corporations, helping them meet the regulatory requirements and uh, engage with, uh, with the stakeholder. Soon after, we uh, participated in the Climate Cake Initiative. We we're one of the finalists there, and we're going to hear more about it in November. Uh, like I said, we spent a month almost in, in Rotterdam for this conference, where uh, we again presented the same concept, and now we're here. So basically, we've been on this wave of opportunity, and we've made the most of it, which kind of like brought us together. We, it just a series of events that lead you somewhere. Uh, so what we really do, uh, this is a poster that we came up during Wet Skills. So uh, what we do is smart monitoring. The, the, like I said, the opportunity we had was to work at, uh, for, uh, come up with a monitoring system for a uranium mine in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, currently, the system that they have is uh, they, they monitor the effluent once every three months. So they send a technician on site, he takes a grab sample, takes it back to the lab and analyzes what is, what is the metal concentration and detects what kind of metals is getting out of the effluent. Uh, it had to be suitable for remote location. This particular mine in northern Saskatchewan is accessible for only three weeks during an entire year, during which time, uh, that, that's the only time they have to send all the raw material that is required to operationalize or maintain the, uh, the mining site. Uh, it definitely had to be economically viable and allow uh, a range of detectable compounds. Uh, so we came up with a combination of two technologies. The first being uh, anodic stripping voltammetry. Uh, it makes use of a bismuth coated electrode. In simple terms, what it does is uh, water from an, uh, you know, an effluent water is sent to a flow regulator. So controlled water is sent inside a chamber with two electrodes on either side. The chamber itself rotates constantly to allow more interaction between the electrodes and the metals in the water. And uh, as the metal touch or come in contact with the electrode, there's a potential difference, which is noted. So it tells you the type of metal and the concentration in, uh, of, of that metal in that particular sample. So over time, it gives you an average value. Uh, this is stored in a SSD and then can be transported anywhere else. So uh, a mine in northern Saskatchewan can be operated from southern Ontario or all the way in Rotterdam. Uh, the second technology we came up, uh, we didn't come up with, but we used was surface plasma resonance, and uh, this basically works, uh, makes use of different refractive indices. The technology has been around for quite a while, and it's extensively used in uh, pharmaceutical research to uh, detect protein. And what they do is they make use of bioligands that helps coagulate uh, heavy metals in water. And then it's just light interaction. You uh, focus light on the metal film, and based on the refractive indices, uh, you can calculate the metal and its concentration. Uh, the advantage and the reason why we have two separate technologies is uh, AVS allows, is more reliable, gives us more, uh, a higher range of detectable metals, whereas SPR gives us a, a better uh, concentration. It's more specific. Uh, a general specs of what we're looking at, uh, the system is something, together they'll be something under 10 kilos, there'll be one unit, uh, it'll give us a value once every hour, it can work on standard power requirements, it can detect a whole bunch of metals, and we can include some off-the-shelf sensors to detect pH, turbidity, conductivity, and temperature, uh, and it's estimated to be somewhere around 40 to 50,000, uh, 40 to 50,000, uh, which kind of sounds a lot, but if you compare it with the current system, where, uh, the one that I mentioned with the grab sample, it almost costs $20,000, where you have to hire a lab technician, he goes and gets that sample and detects it over time. So we're getting rid of that, and we get a much higher resolution data with this sort of a system. Uh, some potential challenges that we seem which may come our way uh, is calibration. This is specific to SPR, the technology we talked about. It runs on a specific plank, and uh, because it is inaccessible, uh, because this location is very inaccessible, if we lose the reference value, it's going to be very hard to set it back. Uh, adverse weather condition. This can be anything. This can be aquatic life. It can be silt or mine that gets into the system and in turn sinks the whole setup down, uh, changes the value in some way 
or it can be uh, terrestrial life, a bear in the region comes in and claws over the system, which apparently happens very often. Uh, and accuracy and precision, since we haven't really done any field tests so far, we have not certain how uh, precise the readings are going to be or what the concentration levels are going to be like. Uh, but what got us really, really excited was going beyond monitoring, and that is why we were, uh, that is why I spent a little time over innovation, like how we see it going beyond a product. Monitoring is just one aspect. So if you look at, you know, in principles of industrial ecology, and we're just basically closing the loop, once we have this high resolution data, it can be used in, in so many ways. Uh, typically, ores, they, uh, there's, there's rarely that you'll come across a single ore. It's, it's a composition of several minerals and metals together. And how a mining process works, it's, it's very raw, it's very crude. So they'll pick up, open this uh, mine, and if they're looking for uranium, they'll break it, flush out everything else, and they'll just look at the region where there's very high concentration of uranium. And all the other minerals and metals are just flushed inside and flushed out to the tailing pond. Because there's no way of differentiating and knowing when are you going to come across a high peak of coal or a high peak of any metal in that region. So that's really hard to detect. In this example, in the district of uh, Saskatchewan, these are commonly the metals that they uh, come across along with uranium, but they don't really look for these metals. They're just looking for uranium. Uh, so taking this a step further, once we have a real-time monitoring system and we have a lot of, uh, we have a data analyzer, we can uh, use this data to effectively close the loop. So if we know that we're going through a high level of gold at this point, or uh, any other metal with a high economic value, we can divert it to a recovery pond and recover those minerals. We can, uh, if we know we're going through uh, environmentally, you know, hazardous compounds, say arsenic or mercury, then we can divert them to monofill ponds and limit them from contaminating the rest of uh, the region. Uh, and finally, we can also go back to the mining process itself and look at the steps. So when, you, once, when you're doing the first wash, is, it, is, it, is that the right time to look for, for recovering metals when we're going through the second wash? Is that ideally the best time? So we can optimize the process and target waste uh, production at the source. Uh, the interesting bit about this and why we think this is really feasible is one thing mines have in common is a lot of space. We can, we can easily come up with different and multiple tailing ponds. The other thing they have is a lot of time. Uh, typically, once a mine is abandoned, the company still retail or maintains the tailing pond for up to easy 40 years. So if, I, uh, if we can manage to segregate the waste and come up with different monofill ponds, even if, those, even, even if the monofill site just contains, for instance, copper, which is... Uh, which may not have an economical viability today to recover it from the mining pond, but 40 years from now, it may have a different figure altogether. Uh, so, which brings me back to the slide where I start, creating mines of the future. Thank you. Everybody, that concludes the FTW competition presentations. Um, and like we said before, we handed out some voting slips. If you would be able to be so kind to um, put that in, in the front, uh, then that would be great. We can tally up the people's choice. Um, and these finalists can make themselves available following or like in the center. Um, there's, I don't believe there's poster presentations today, so you can enjoy some snacks and discuss with them. Thank you all so much for coming.